So I got a chance to sit down with both lead game designers of Diablo 4 last November during that big press preview event when you saw a lot of hands-on early impressions. I even made a video for my playtime with that. For whatever reason, I totally forgot to make a video about the interview. I, I don't know, but here, here we are today. Uh, while parts of what we covered was information some of you may already know, going back through, I did find some new details that I thought you might find interesting. If nothing else, there were a few specifics about various systems here and there, and it's also just another chance to discuss some of these topics and talk about this game that I am so looking forward to. We did have a pretty short window of time, and the main thing that we were discussing were basically the various types of endgame activities and some things about account progression. So I just opened up by asking them to broadly talk about some endgame systems. Now the first thing they talked about was one system that comes online after you finish the campaign called Whispers of the Dead. They said, these are layered rewards on top of existing activities. So it'll rotate between say, now these dungeons give you progression towards a separate track. And when you fill that track, you turn it in and you can choose a cache of rewards, go out, repeat, collect your cash, so on and so on. Now this is essentially Diablo 4's version of the bounty system that we saw in Diablo 3, but with a different emphasis, with a different focus. We were actually given some slightly more details on this system thanks to one of Blizzard's blog posts. They said, completing the associated task will be met with experience, gold, and grim favors. The number of grim favors you receive for completing a whisper or a quest will vary, but once you collect 10, they can be exchanged at the Tree of Whispers for a bevy of loot and experience. They said the type of whispers a player sees on the map will rotate frequently, which just basically means the quest types and their objectives will change with new ones becoming available throughout the day for you to track. Each whisper will offer both a different set of rewards and experience for completing it. Now we did also learn from there was that uh, end, end game beta test that happened in the fall and some people leaked information. They ignored the NDAs but we learned some pretty cool stuff from that. One of the main ones was that this system the whispers of the dead can help you focus on getting targeted pieces of gear. So we learned that once you've accumulated those 10 points and you go to the Tree of Whispers, what you're actually choosing is from one of three randomly generated loot sources. So these will be called something like the Stash of Helms, or the Stash of One-Handed Bludgeoning Weapons, or the Stash of any other piece or type of gear. If you know that you need a helm or gloves or offhands or whatever, doing these will give you a reasonable chance of hitting a stash with at least one of the slots that you're looking for. As they mentioned, it's kind of layered on top of the things you're already doing. So while you're doing endgame stuff, while you're out engaging in the uh, the open world stuff, while you're fighting bosses, and while you're clearing through dungeons, in particular the nightmare dungeons, which are the endgame variants, there are likely to be quests either in route to those activities or specifically tied to those activities. A lot of different ways to acquire gear. The next one were the hell tides. I asked what they could say for the hell tide system. Their response was, this is an area of the world that gets taken over and you get higher monster density or intensity of monsters, and you have more environmental threats, such as meteors raining down every so often. I think that aspect of Helltides I had not known about in the past. I just assumed the area is going to be you know, there's more elites, basically, you know what I mean? Maybe there's more basic enemies and there's more elites, and I assume that's what was all it's going to be. But it's interesting that there is going to be, like, environmental threats like the meteors or acid rain or pools of lava or something that's going to hurt your character, right? And I actually did later learn that these Helltide events will also coincide with a visual change to the areas. It's more so than more enemies, harder enemies, and some stuff coming from the sky. There's going to be, like, a, a visual overhaul, probably a dimming of the lights. Maybe things get a little more red or something, you know what I mean? To further quote them though, they said that you'll have these things called harbingers that will spawn. They're basically more powerful versions of elites. All the while, you're killing these monsters to collect a currency to unlock different chests across the area for Helltide events. Now we do actually know specifics about that. We know that Helltides will be unlocking once we get to World Tier 3, also known as Nightmare Difficulty. And killing monsters in a Helltide zone will have a chance to drop this currency that is called Cinders, and those can be used to open these Helltide chests that will be scattered throughout the zone. The chests are said to boast bountiful boons exclusive to singular item slots, so kind of like 
the Tree of Whispers. This appears to be another way to go after targeted gear. One interesting note that I actually wasn't previously aware of is that these cinders that you acquire in the Helltide events, this currency, if you die, you will drop it and it has to be reclaimed. Now, the one thing I'm not certain of is if this is something that can be griefed by other players or if you dropping your cinders can only be reclaimed by you. I'm assuming the latter is the case. I There's plenty of room for griefing in the PvP side of this game that I'm sure is going to happen. Now, one question I had about Helltides was if it cycled through all of the zones or if they were to uh, pre-existing zones. And the response was they cycle through all zones in the game. The only exception is towns. Anywhere is up for grabs within the world of... Um, Sanctuary, the world of sanctuary within the world of Diablo 4 for potentially becoming a Helltide, which once more is just an overhauled end game progression thing that you'll go to. Love to see them use the entirety of the content instead of having content become dead content, which we'll talk more about when we get to the uh, Nightmare Dungeon system. More information from those beta testers. Uh, they said that Helltides are basically like the Terror Zones in D2R. These are the best for getting high level drops, much like Terror Zones. An area of the map will be caught up in a Helltide, and this report reportedly lasted for an hour and then after the helltide concludes there will be no more helltide for the next hour and then after that a new helltide spawns up that lasts an hour so on and so on good source of loot and crafting materials as well as gold now let's talk about nightmare dungeons this is the overhauled versions of the basic dungeons in the game i asked them to explain a little bit about how the system works and specifically how the key system works with it the keys are actually now called sigils and they start dropping later in the game you're going to get your first key it will be for a specific dungeons and this includes the side dungeons the ones you get legendary powers from all of those can potentially become a nightmare dungeon it's just a matter of whether or not you get the key because the keys you get will be for random dungeons now i asked if there was a specific method of acquiring these nightmare sigils or if you could get them from multiple sources while playing the game their response was that that is something they're still sorting out so it looks like they haven't nailed down exactly where and how you're going to be getting sigils but you'll be getting them somehow they'll be a for a specific dungeon and then you go to that dungeon and i quite like this i i really enjoy the idea that we'll be getting keys for one of the random 100 plus dungeons that are in the game because it gives us a, a reason to revisit that part of the world i really like systems that make use of the entirety of the game content. One thing that is commonly uh, a critique of a lot of big open world RPGs or MMOs that have this like power progression, a lot of the content gets left behind. Now, obviously we want fresh and new content, exciting new areas and places to visit, but I do like when games make use of the entirety of what is in the game so that, you know, after our first hundred hours or so, we're never visiting the first three zones. That I don't like when games do that. It is, it's almost, there's like a nostalgia played into it remembering when you first started playing and everything is so exciting so getting to go back to that there's just something nice and pleasant about that but then also you built all this stuff make use of it make it all relevant throughout the course of players power progressions here's some more details about this uh, nightmare dungeon system from beta testers they said nightmare dungeons are like a combination of diablo 3's greater rifts and path of exiles maps like greater rifts they will go up in some high levels and eventually boost monster levels past the max player level and like maps Maps, they will roll with both positive and negative affixes that affect the difficulty as well as the rewards. They say that the level uh, gear that you get from this is like average, but completing a nightmare dungeon gives you glyph experience and that levels up the glyphs in your paragon board. This is a real big long-term progression system. Maybe at first you're going to start out really just focusing on getting the gear drops, trying to get the higher rarity gears and getting all of your legendary powers that you want for a build. Throughout the course of playing the game, the real big push will be grinding these nightmare dungeons dungeons so that you can keep expanding upon your paragon board because the rewards from that are deterministic instead of just you know waiting on those drops now the next system that we're going to talk about one of my personal favorites is the pvp but before we get into that you might have been wondering force what's up with the glasses well let me tell you, sitting at the PC all day and or looking at our phones, one thing that we all deal with is exposure to blue light. Blue light is one of the many factors that can lead to eye strain, headaches, and even trouble falling asleep. I know personally I deal with this if I'm on my phone for any length of time or at the computer before bed. Sometimes I'll have trouble for even potentially hours falling asleep. Well, recently I was sent a pair of these GMG glasses, which are designed to shield against blue light and as such help with things like reducing eye strain and preventing interruptions 
to sleeping. They also say these glasses can help with improving your concentration, encouraging eye reflexes, and maintaining the quality of your vision over time. I've had mine for a bit now. As someone who doesn't otherwise wear glasses, they felt comfortable on the face and appear to have helped me, at least subjectively, that seems to be the case. So if you're interested in trying them out for yourself, check out my link in the description below. For the next 48 hours, you can get up to 40% off your purchase. Thank you to GMG for sponsoring today's video. Now let's talk about the fields of hatred. So these are areas of the world dedicated to open PvP. The way they've been described as like the lore reason for this, they say that the hatred of Mephisto has been bubbling up from hell, created these areas in the open world that consume you and make you want to turn against your fellow players. I don't need a lore reason to want to PvP in these games, but there is one. Functionally, we know that you'll go into these zones and it's just like a regular zone, but also there's this extra layer. So either by killing monsters or other players, you will get this resource called the Sea seeds of hatred. The seeds themselves are actually useless until they are extracted into red dust, which you will do at these altars. So you go to an altar, you deposit any seeds you collect, and then they will slowly start converting to red dust. The problem is that this process takes time and while it's happening, nearby players are alerted. There'll be some sort of notification telling people in the area, hey, someone's turning their shards into red dust. And what this will do, of course, is focus some PVP conflict because anyone who kills you can collect any of the seeds that haven't yet been converted into red dust. Now, the good news is that once you've converted seeds into red dust, it doesn't matter if you die, you will keep it with you. But the whole idea is while people are running around if you go into the zone and you fight some monsters, you collect some seeds, a player comes, you you win, you, you take them out, you get some seeds, you are vulnerable and can potentially lose all of that if you don't get to a shrine, convert it to red dust, which again takes time and tells people that it's happening. So really going to be an interesting, I, I do quite enjoy open world PVP, especially open world PVPs that has systems like this where they can focus the conflict because they're supposed to be quite big zones. Blizzard has said that camping shouldn't be an issue because these areas are so large. And then obviously they can also further emphasize that by just constricting the number of people that are within these zones, given the size so that people aren't likely to be camped. We'll see how that plays out in actuality. So I had a couple of questions for them. I was specifically curious if these fields of hatred were static locations or if they rotated like the hell tides do. The answer is they are static. They say that you will not accidentally trip into one. You will always know exactly where they are. Now, I do recall hearing at some point that the game was going to be launching with two fields of hatred zones. I don't, however, remember where I got this information. It might've been from one of those beta test leaks. I do hope that there are more than just two. I would love if there was a field of hatred zone in every zone. We know there's gonna be five overland zones in the game. Put a field of hatred zone in all of them. But I guess that's also something that they could potentially be adding with time with the various updates that they're gonna be getting. That's the whole reason for the battle pass and all of that. Well, no, the reason for that stuff is them making money. The hopefully net positive for us, the players, is that they continue to update. So maybe we get more fields of hatred in the future, but I I'm pretty sure I heard that we're only gonna have one when the game launches. I'm sorry, two when the game launches. Now, the next thing I was curious about is why you're going to those zones. Obviously, you're going there for the PvP, but what about the other methods of gear acquisition and player power? And I actually quite liked the answer. They said that the gear from these areas isn't distinct from what you will get from other similar end game activities. The underlying thought is we have a lot of people who play this game who like PvP, and we wanted to make sure we gave them a place where they can do that without having to sacrifice their PvE progression. It's not a place where you just go to punch other players. It's a place where you can go do that, but also gear up. They said that the same events that we were talking about before for the open world, they will appear there just like they do everywhere else in the game. And that extra resource is just another cool mechanic and system where players can fight over. They take that red dust and then they can turn it in for upgrades. So if you like PVP, it looks like you're not gonna have to sacrifice the process of gearing up. And the final question I asked was, how are you gonna handle like the gear and power balance in these PVP zones? Their response unfortunately was, it is a work in progress and yes, I am very curious because there's a lot of ways you can do this, right? There's a lot of different, you can just go with like the percentage level scaling. So like everyone gets scaled up to the same baseline power, but if you happen to be super geared, you get like five or 10% bonus boost to your PVP 
capabilities, your health, your damage, your CC reduction, you know, whatever it is. Or instead of that, you have the player who's been playing for a thousand hours, uh, like a thousand percent <laughs> but more powerful than the level 20 noob who's walking around in blues and one or two yellows. There's pros and cons to both. Uh, you know, I do quite like the appeal of the crazy over leveled superpower, just grinding people into dust basically. But I know that uh, um, nowadays that doesn't tend to happen. And frankly, from a Blizzard game in 2023, I don't expect that that's going to be the case. I do expect they will do some sort of power balancing. That's just like my gut feeling. We'll have to see how it plays out in reality. And now besides going there and getting gear, which as you know, now you can get the same level gear as you do doing any other end game activity. You should also know that red dust can be traded in for PVP specific cosmetics and mounts. Love to see it. Give me some cool badass looking PVP gear that tells people that I, I, I'm crushing noobs. I mean, that's probably not gonna be me personally, honestly, not, not nowadays, but I like when games have stuff like that. All right, now I, we're gonna touch on some of the open world activities because some of these are tied into the end game systems as well. So they said that there will be events you just stumble upon. These are called local events and they're meant to be these like minute long encounters that you just do because you run into them. But then larger than that are the events like the world bosses and region events. These are actually marked on your map, specific locations. You can see them from a distance just by checking out your map. And they also have a timer so you know when they're gonna start so you have time to travel there. So we saw the events, I, I, I covered this in my open world video. The, just the open world systems and all the various things you can do are one of the main reasons I'm looking forward to Diablo 4. You know, they've got public events, um, pretty basic stuff. There'll be like a combat altar where you fight a lot of enemies or a blood altar where you fight enemies, but you get to stand on these pressure plates to siphon your blood from you into this like artifact. Or maybe there'll be like skeletal bone structures you have to destroy, or you have to protect uh, people in a caravan that crashed or escort a wayward soul or liberate a castle. Like they mentioned in that quote there, these are expected to last about a minute they're smaller scale they're not really the end game the end game versions of these are the boss battles but then also those zone wide events the zone events are just way more involved you're going to see a lot of players there they're a lot more difficult there are multiple stages we saw one of these in the preview events i tried doing it with just my one friend we got crushed we didn't have the damage we didn't have the survivability to complete it these are these difficult events that are uh, either going to require you to be overpowered or to have a lot of other players around in order to complete but then of course there are the boss battles the world boss fight a lot of fun huge scale multi-phase boss should be requiring a lot of people or overpowered players for that given level and just one of the coolest things is how they set the stage by zooming the camera out way further than normal to just show you the massive scale of the boss and they're going to go through all these huge different attacks you know it's a boss fight you you get it from beta testing we did learn that world bosses while they do have like high unique and legendary drop rates the biggest thing is that they drop materials to socket your items. So for the most part, it seems like while you're gearing up and you're constantly replacing gear up until you're having like ancestral versions of all pieces, you'll constantly want to be farming world bosses to get that resource to put sockets into your gear. So it seems like a world boss rotation is something that is going to be a regular part of your end game progression. Okay, so those are the basic systems that you'll be rotating through in end game and through that interview, there was some new information and details, which is pretty cool. I also asked them about wider, like account wide progression. And they talked about end game being as a gradient. So playing that build that we did, we saw something that was called region rewards, where you open up your map and you see this little bar with various activities in the region. So of this, they said, that is one of those things that kind of permeates your experience from start to finish. They, they call it this mid game almost, something that you start from the very beginning and you invest more and more time in as you keep going. The main reason being is because there are rewards from this that you cannot get anywhere else. They are explicitly exclusive to this zone completion. They said, we tried to do our best to make sure that those rewards are always appealing whenever you get them. That is one of people's first real systemic content that they will engage with in the game. So yeah, in playing that preview last November, we saw this in action. It was called region progress specifically. Basically, it just asks you to do certain things, collect, discover, or complete things within a zone 
for rewards. So specifically in the Fractured Peaks, we were asked to discover seven waypoints, clear three strongholds, complete 24 side quest, find 83 areas, clear 23 side dungeons, and activate 28 altars of Lilith. Doing any one of these things will reward you with a set amount of renown, which fills up a bar that's kind of like an experience bar. This progresses and will unlock rewards in five tiers. So every tier would come with some character experience as well as 10,000 gold. In addition to that, there would be an account wide unlock. So tier one gave one skill point. Tier two was a potion charge. Tier three was a skill point. Tier four was a skill point. And tier five gave four paragon points. So these skill points, potion charges, and paragon points are exclusive to the region progress system. And as mentioned, they are account wide unlocked. So for example, if you clear the fractured peaks on your barbarian and then you go make a sorcerer right away, you're going to have three extra skill points, four paragon points, and a bonus potion charge. And that was just one of the game's five overland zones. If they happen to follow the same reward structure, we may be looking at an additional 15 skill points, five potion charges, and 20 paragon points for every one of your characters on your account. And again, this is just a system of something else for you to work towards beyond any of your character specific gear and progress, the sockets, the pieces that you're getting, the sets that you're building for your specific barbarian. This is something else that will apply to everything on your account. Now, another system that applies account wide are the legendary power aspects. So they said one of the things attached to this are all of those available side dungeons in the game. The first time you do any of them, you get this unique legendary power with it and you unlock that permanently to be able to use in crafting. Now, this was also something that we got to see in the hands-on preview. This is referred to as the Codex of Power. As mentioned, you complete a dungeon that will unlock an aspect that is specific to that dungeon. So you can see these ahead of time. Once you like clear the fog of war on the map and you see a dungeon location, you can mouse over and it will show you the exact legendary aspect that comes from it. There are 115 in the game, according to the build that we played. That number could, of course, change come launch. They were broken up into five different categories categories, which were defensive, offensive, resource, utility, and mobility, with each category can apply to specific gear types. So for example, offensive aspects could go on either amulets, weapons, gloves, or rings, while mobility aspects could go on boots or amulets, and that is the case for the other categories as well. So you clear a dungeon, you get the aspect, and then you just have to head into town to the occultist, and then using some resources can then enchant any piece of qualifying gear with that aspect. Now, most aspects were classified specific. So while playing in the Barbarian, you might clear a dungeon that has a Druid aspect, but you know, again, you can see this stuff ahead of time and eventually you're going to un want to unlock all of them. But there were also some general ones that could be used by any class, like movement speed ones or ones that gave you shields and things like that. One important note about these legendary powers from the aspect system is that they are always the weakest version of that type of power. So for example, if I clear a dungeon that gives me the aspect of anemia, which makes it so that I I have a 31% chance when striking a bleeding enemy to stun them for two seconds. That's great, but I will still want to hunt for gear drops that have that power on it because it will be stronger. Basically, legendary powers all roll within a range and the aspect version is always the minimum value of that range. So for the reason, it's not the case that once you've cleared all the dungeons and you have all the aspects that you're all set, you have best in slot gear, you just got to enchant everything at the occultist. The item hunt is still present. You will still be grinding for gear pieces because all of them, unless you get incredibly unlikely, all of them will be at least one percentage better than the ones that you get from the aspect system. So that in conjunction with the zone clearing, these are the two main forms of account progression in Diablo 4. And with that, that pretty much wraps up all of the main bits of information and details that we got from that interview. Now, I do want to add, they did say that a lot of the specifics of these systems are up in the air. It, you know, the game's not finished yet. It hasn't gone gold. Some, so some of the exact details may change between now and release when we're talking about the numbers of things. I guess a good example potentially could be those numbers of Fields of Hatred. Maybe they do launch with more than the two that I had heard about. Now, there was also a group interview that took place, although that contained questions along the lines of, uh, I was confused by the open world. I didn't know where to go which you just, you just deal with group interviews tend to not be super fruitful in my experience. Just you get people with varying degrees of knowledge and understanding of the games, of the franchises, of the genres, and of 
player capability. I don't know, a nicer way to put it. So, but anyways, I might siphon through that at some point and see if I can pull out any nuggets of information. But that does it for my one-on-one -on -one interview, focused mostly on the end game systems and account-wide progression. Hopefully you found something in here that was new and useful. I do believe there were a few bits of information here that I hadn't seen discussed anywhere else, but I could have missed it. Maybe some of this was brought up in some of the various interviews about Diablo 4 over the years. But yeah, either way, that does it for me today. Thank you guys for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. I'll see you in the next one. Take it easy.